Welcome to The Money Runner. I'm David Nelson, your host. This is going to be kind of free form. Uh, I'm just going to talk, uh, run you through my thinking. It's been a pretty busy week. We're knee deep in earnings. Uh, the new cycle is, is pretty heavy. It is uh, Thursday. Uh, I had a lot on my plate today, and it wasn't a good day for me. Uh, uh, I had one, I, I had trouble really with two stocks, one that I owned and one that I didn't. Uh, the one that I owned uh, was a company called Newmont Mining and uh, pretty well-known, you know, gold exploration company. It's been a great stock, made a lot of money in the stock uh, this year, gave a lot back today. Uh, they reported earnings last night. It was pretty clear it was a miss, but the conference call wasn't going to take place until uh, until today, around 11 o'clock in the morning. And so I had to wait to then because I really wanted uh, the details. And it was pretty clear sitting on that call, it was going to be ugly. Uh, you could even hear it in, in, in the tenor of the voices of some of the analysts uh, talking on the call. In particular, I, I can't remember her name. She was from Bank of America. She seemed you know, pretty upset. Uh, nevertheless, as it got worse and worse, and they were talking about the amount of inflation they're seeing and, and how it's uh, hitting their costs and their profits are going down. Uh, it just kept ticking down. I exited the stock. Uh, it was a pretty ugly day, and it hurt my portfolio, uh, but so be it. There have been other winners uh, you know, in, over the last couple of weeks, like Netflix and others, but it was a bad day. Uh, it it uh, hurt my performance. The other one that hurt my performance today was a stock I didn't own, and that was Tesla. Tesla surprised the street last night, putting in uh, a surprising, a surprising quarter in, fa in, in the fact that their margins were up. I don't think analysts were really expecting that, and uh, I knew the stock was going to be up pretty strongly this morning. Uh, I listened to Elon on the call, and uh, it was he's he's always an impressive guy. Uh, There'll be bulls and bears on both sides of this as to what, whether or not they want to own the stock. It's still a very, very expensive stock. But if you're buying into the future, like many have, uh, this has been a fun stock for today anyway. This stock was up about 21%. Why is that important to me if I don't own it? Well, most people look at the portfolios I run, and they're probably going to compare it to the S&P 500. Tesla's 1.2% of the index coming into today, 1.2%. So you take 20% times 1.2%, and that's a big number. You're probably in the 20s there, uh, 25, 6, 7, I haven't done the math. Whatever it is, it, it, it's a big number. That's, what, that's a negative rel relative return for me. So that hurts me that I did not own such an important stock like that. So that's how my day went. You throw in the news cycle that's uh, been, I guess, chaotic uh, is, is a fairly, uh, fairly accurate term. You know, we're, like I said, knee deep in earnings. So we've got four, five, six, seven companies reporting a day. Uh, but also the news cycle is revolving around, around the election and the geopolitical, you know, uh, backdrop that we live with each and every day. So we're back to basics. And the things that are matter that matter right now are earnings, the Fed, interest rates, the economy always. And like I said, we're less than two weeks from an election and the geopolitical backdrop, you've got, you know, two raging wars on either side of the plan planet. That last one, nothing I can do about that. Uh, geopolitical events will happen at any point in time. Uh, and you just have to deal with it. The election, that's going to pass in a couple of weeks. But like I said in, in a podcast a couple of weeks ago, uh, you could easily see you know, lawyers with parachutes as lawyers descend on various counties looking uh, for votes that might be questionable. But hands down, the most important dynamic and the thing that everybody's talking about, at least in my world, is interest rates. Guys, throw up the yield curve chart because I, I think it's important. I, I throw this up every couple of weeks, and you can see there uh, that uh, over the last month, that's where the yield curve was a month ago. That's where we are today. Even We're even above where we were a week ago. Uh, why does that matter? Because rates drive so much of our decision thinking. 
our decision process. Uh, you know, interest rates affect the economy. It affects credit card rates. Uh, it affects loan rates. Uh, it affects the ability for companies to fund their work, work in capital. All of these things really matter. It certainly affects mortgage rates, and it affects the housing market. And think of how much, how, what, what a big portion of the world of, of our economy is represented by housing. If for no other reason, it represents such a, a large portion of the wealth of uh, you know, American citizens out there who own their homes. So it matters. And the changing dynamic uh, with, with rates right now is it almost feels like you know, the rug is kind of being pulled out from, from underneath us. We've been banking on these rate cuts. We've anticipated these rate cuts. We got one, 50 basis points. But slowly but surely, it seems like markets are being forced to digest the idea that we're not going to get the rate, rate relief that we thought. Look at this Fed funds uh, futures chart. Uh, look in the middle there. What we were expecting uh, was about 140 basis points of Fed fund cuts be between now and say, you know, the first quarter of uh, sometime in the first quarter of 2025 next year. 1.4%. Uh, Unfortunately, that, that chart you're looking at, that's from last month. That's what we were expecting back then. Now, uh, what, what, what the street is expecting is less than half that, uh, or about half that. Uh, that changes what we're going to invest in, and it forces us to rethink our playbook and, and adjust accordingly. Uh, look at it another way. Look at this you know, 10-year uh, Treasury fund futures chart. Uh, this is like a bonds. So bond goes down, the yield goes up. And you can see uh, you know, that pretty sharp channel to the downside there. Bonds have been headed down. It's having a good day today with 10-year yields uh, down about five basis points. And you can see that what I, I put there is the July support. That was uh, you know, kind of a, a, a level that goes back to July. We held that level. And I guess that's, that's kind, of, kind of important here for, for bond guys. Let's turn that upside down. Because when we turn it upside down, I think it, it gives us a, a very uh, definitive picture of what's really taking place. Now, this chart goes back two years. And you can see the peak of 10-year yields was, I'm going to call that October 2023, about a year ago. And about a year ago was the market low uh, of... of uh, I shouldn't say that. That was the beginning of the next leg of the bull market. Uh, markets had kind of rolled over. I'm going to show you that in a, in, a, in a second. But the rhetoric had changed. Suddenly around that time, we started to get you know, wind of the fact that the Fed might be at the end of their hiking cycle and, in fact, be starting to comp contemplate uh, rate cuts. We didn't know when the cuts were going to come. We just started to get confidence that it was going to happen. And... You can see that in the next chart, uh, what, what actually took place then. Now, you got that same 10-year yield on top, only on the bottom, what I've drawn is the S&P 500. And you can see, as yields marched higher, stocks did not like that, all right? Stocks did not like that. I guarantee you, if we start to march higher in 10-year yields and we start to drift higher, it's going to be a very different conversation, uh, we're going to start to he hear rhetoric like uh, questions like, is, is Apple overvalued uh, if 10-year yields are this high? Is it, is it really worth 30 times forward earnings? How about Microsoft? How about uh, NVIDIA? How about Alphabet? How about Meta? Yeah, they all may be growing, but is, are they worth what we're paying for them if the yield rises? The truth is long-duration assets, which are large-cap secular growth stocks, do not like rising interest rates. They, don't, they tend not to do well uh, during that point in time. So as you can see in that box up in the upper right there, that's what I'm watching. I think the market can handle rates going a bit higher, maybe 4.5, 4, 4.6. They start getting above that level. I'm going to need a different playbook as to what I'm going to buy. Uh, I might even have to go back to my 2022 playbook. 
And much like a football player and a football coach, you get out that red zone playbook. That's what I've driven drawn here, the red zone. Uh, if you'll start to get into that red zone, I'm going to change my tune. And what I did uh, was go back to that period of time and, and start to analyze what was working back then, if anything. And what you're looking at right there is, you know, factor chart. And it goes back to from July of 2023 to the end of October 2023, kind of the same time period I showed you on the previous uh, slide. These are factors. Uh, these are factor performance charts. And what we do is we go long short. So if I'm looking at a value factor with a basket of value stocks, uh, we're long the, the, the cheapest stocks, we're short. The, the most expensive stocks. If it's growth, we're long the highest growth, short the, the lowest growth. This is just, just a test to see what's working and what isn't. And what you could see back during that period of time is that value stocks were outperforming. They were working. On the other side of that, growth stocks were not. Low volatility stocks were working. On the other side of that, momentum stocks were not. Kind of the opposite of, of this year. Dividend stocks were doing okay. Uh, I question how far they can go uh, in that environment uh, because if you think about it, if, if you're getting a dividend, let's say you're getting a dividend of, uh, of uh, 4%, well, if you can get more than that in a 10-year treasury and lock it up, you might, might choose to take that route. Nevertheless, dividend stocks uh, certainly did better. So it's going to be a different conversation. And you're going to have to get out a different playbook and start to adjust uh, accordingly. Uh, I want to end uh, the program uh, with uh, a talk about the election because I know it's a concern for a lot of you. And I've had a lot of emails from, from many of you saying, you know, what if my preferred candidate does not get in? Is it the end of the market? Because that, that's how everybody looks at it from, from the lens of their – of uh, whatever their, their political aspirations are. Uh, they think it's the end of stocks. And, and the truth is, is when you look back, there's not a lot the executive branch on their own can do that's going to affect uh, the market. And I throw this chart up because uh, I've been saying this for some time, but I didn't have any hard research to back it up. And Deutsche Bank put this together, and I, I, this is excellent. You can see there, uh, red is obviously Republican administrations, uh, blue is Democratic, and you can see this goes back all the way to 1900. What's pretty obvious right away is that the average return for most presidents during their, their, their time in office for the S&P 500 is about 13 to 16 percent. That's the average. Uh, the Biden-Harris administration currently right now are annualized out for their uh, – almost four years in office at 14%. Trump a little higher, 16%. Uh, Obama a little less than that. Bush, 43. Uh, he struck out. Uh, uh, he got wiped out by the financial crisis. Clinton, uh, of course, did well. Nixon, uh, not so much. Uh, not a good period of time for, for the economy. The market, certainly not for Richard Nixon. The hands-down winner, Calvin Coolidge during the Roaring Twenties. And an annualized return of 29% during his term in office. And the loser, the all-time loser, Herbert Hoover, uh, the following administration, I, I don't even know what that number is, but it was the Great Depression. You can bet it was pretty ugly uh, during that period of time. What I would look to instead, in terms of your stocks, obviously who wins the election is important to each and every one of us. What I would look to instead is Look to see what happens in the House and the Senate. If you see a clean sweep in either direction, well, then policy is going to change, and maybe in a dramatic fa fashion. Uh, there are some concerns that uh, if Trump is president, the tariffs might raise interest rates. Uh, there's a lot of concern, I know, if uh, the Harris, uh, Harris administration would raise taxes, especially corporate taxes. That's going to affect profits. Stocks aren't going to like that. Those are the kinds of things that would really you know, change the backdrop for stocks. Who wins the election? Uh, I want, uh, you know, right after that, I don't, I don't think stocks truly respond to that. What stocks will respond to is if, in fact, you see uh, the, 
that we haven't been able to choose a president. And that, that, that's a very real possibility. Uh, as I put out in, in my podcast, uh, Lawyers with Parachutes, Parachutes, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, it, literally, it literally could be days, if not weeks, before we have an idea who the president is. It's that tight. If, if you're going to believe the polls, it is literally that tight. So you can bet those battleground states, they'll be in there contesting those. And in the end, this might be decided uh, by, the, by the Supreme Court. All right, that's, that's all I've got this week. Uh, I'm out of ideas, and I'm certainly out of charts, uh, and I'm out, out of time. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. If you want more information, of course, go to my Substack site, uh, dcnelson123 at substack.com. A lot of charts, uh, the podcasts are posted there, and I also post my network appearances, whether it's uh, Bloomberg, uh, Fox Business, CNBC, whatever. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm David Nelson, and this is The Money Runner.